And welcome once again to this week's Green Entrepreneurship Workshop Series. Uh, my name is Brock Dickinson. I'm the Entrepreneur in Residence with the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. And I'm happy to be with everybody today to make a, a brief introduction to today's program. I want to start by uh, acknowledging that the University of Waterloo, which is hosting today's event, is situated on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples, and that the University of Waterloo itself uh, is located on the Haldeman Tract, which is land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River. I'd also like to acknowledge that today I'm actually in Buffalo, in, in upstate New York, which is on the traditional territory of the Seneca Nation. The Seneca Nation is a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, uh, and also by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua, which uh, is a, an agreement between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, to affirm Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty uh, in the state of New York. And I invite each of you, no matter where you are today, to reflect on the territories that you are currently occupying, whose territories those are and that those were, uh, and, and how uh, your relationship with Indigenous and traditional peoples uh, influences the way in, in which you live your life today. That's obviously a key theme in today's session, which focuses on how we can champion Indigenous youth startups. I, I want to start by uh, indicating again that if you want to hear this, uh, this, um, this uh, uh, workshop in your own language, you can go to the interpretation icon at the bottom of the screen, select English, French, or Spanish, and you'll, you'll hear the entire session in that language. There is a chat function that's open. We'd invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're connecting from today, maybe uh, which uh, to the territories you are currently occupying uh, and share some of that kind of information with us. There's also a Q&A function. And as the session progresses, we'd invite you to submit questions through the Q&A function so that we can pass those along to our presenters and speakers at the appropriate moment. Uh, the University of Waterloo, as always, wants to acknowledge the great partnership that we have with the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, which is working with us to develop, host, and deliver these workshops. We couldn't do this without them, uh, and so we're very, very grateful for the partnership that's been put in place. We'd also like to acknowledge our partners in the Eco Innovation Network. This is a collection uh, of eight uh, universities across North America that are working together to support uh, eco-innovation, green innovation, uh, 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 sustainable innovation, social innovation, uh, and that our work connects to many of the themes that we'll explore today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our MC or our facilitator for today's session. Heather Garrick is the Green Innovation Program Developer uh, at the University of Waterloo, where she works at the intersection of entrepreneurship, education, uh, and sustainable development. She works with uh, students, with faculty, with local startups, uh, social enterprises, and she develops new programs, courses, and educational material uh, of relevance to, the, to these groups and stakeholders. She also works closely with the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, where she manages the North America Eco Innovation Network. And prior to joining the University of Waterloo, Heather was the head of sustainable development at the Satellite Applications Catapult in the United Kingdom, and she founded and ran the startup company and was director of operations for a startup incubator in Oxford in the UK. Heather, it's great to have you with us today, and I will turn things over to you to take us from here. All right, thank you very much, Brock, and hello, everybody. I'm Heather, and, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. This is the Championing Indigenous Youth Startups Workshop. This is the fourth session in a series of five workshops that we've had on the topic of green entrepreneurship. It's been developed by the University of Waterloo Entrepreneurship and Environment Office, as Brock mentioned, uh, with support from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation and the Eco Innovation Network. It's designed for youth, students, and entrepreneurs from across Canada, the United States, and Mexico and it's being translated simultaneously into English, French, and Spanish. So as, as we mentioned at the beginning, please make sure that you're connected uh, to the right audio channel. So just take a moment, um, it should be towards the bottom of your screen, the little earth icon, and select English, French, or Spanish for today's session. We are excited to be joined by more than 1,400 participants who have signed up for this workshop. It's been going for a few weeks, 
and have people from 76 countries joining us. You've seen a few comments in the chat, people saying hello from, from where they are. So please, please say hello, let us know where you're coming from. We have people joining from as far afield as France, Tanzania, India, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and the Kennewick Mohawk Territory. So welcome everybody. So my role today, I will be your host and I will be introducing today's speakers and presenters as we go through uh, presentations from today's three panelists. Towards the end, we will have an open Q&A where you can um, enter your questions into the, the Q&A field also inside this Zoom meeting. And yeah, just, just put your questions in there and we will pose those directly to the panelists. Um, I'll do my best to select a few, probably won't have time to go through all of them but we would love to see what you would like to hear from them. This should uh, conclude in about 90 minutes time. So we're going to start the, the panel shortly and move through some presentations. Uh, we're going to invite each of our panelists to talk for about 15 minutes on the question of championing indigenous youth startups. So I'll introduce each of them before they speak and as I said, just be thinking of your questions as they go through their presentations to put in the Q&A section. We're going to go ahead and get started with Jacob Crane, our first presenter. So I'll, I'll introduce him. Jacob is an, in, an indigenous entrepreneur and enjoys building startup companies that positively impact native communities. Like many, he wishes to see more conscious tribal investment for future generations. That also creates platforms to build stronger, robust indigenous economies. In 2019, Jacob was awarded the, the Billy Mills Dream Starter Grant for his entrepreneurial journey of creating his very own media production company. He was also a part of the Renewing Indigenous Economies cohort with the Hoover Institute at Stanford University this past summer. I'll now hand it over to you, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Dadanist Ada Seze Jacob Crane at A. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Crane. I am from Sutana Nation, uh, located in so called Alberta, um, which is in Canada. And it's a pleasure to be here today to introduce myself. I'm currently calling from the traditional territory of the Utes located in uh, Utah, actually, just outside of Salt Lake City. So I'm really happy to be here um, to share knowledge in this um, space with everybody here about uh, championing, you know, young Indigenous entrepreneurship. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. I hope that's all right with everybody. So yeah, so my name is Jacob Crane. I am the Indigenous Entrepreneurship Program Manager at St. Paul's University College uh, in partnership with the University of Waterloo. And I facilitate their entrepreneurship program um, in partnership, of course, with Greenhouse, which Greenhouse is a social innovation um, uh, center here at St. Paul's University College. And so I've been with the program now for about a year and a half. And um, we basically, we teach students, young people, how to start businesses and, and grow their businesses, but it's from an indigenous lens, an indigenous perspective. And so some of the things that we kind of um, ran into early on was one, indigenous entrepreneurship usually is very community driven. So that's the community really getting behind the indigenous business and supporting that that uh, that dream on when it launches throughout its throughout its uh, journey, but it's also very culturally connected. And what I mean by culturally connected is usually it'll have an indigenous flavor to it, like a like a name. The name will be indigenous. Um, its values tend to be very indigenous, as well as um, the service that it's providing. So. In, in, in my uh, line of work and some of the things that I do, I'm, I'm a media production guy. And so I take, uh, I'll go ahead and film. I'll film um, young indigenous people's stories and I'll put them on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram as a way of like sharing those messages out to the greater community. Um, and these are of young people, young people, you know, just leaving tips on what they're doing and what's working for them in their lives. 
And so it's, it's basically a platform that um, highlights young aspiring indigenous leaders in hopes of inspiring the next generation of indigenous leaders. So there's the connection because I, I kind of, you know, found out early on that not everybody can afford to go to a, a fancy conference to hear motivational speakers that are young and indigenous speak and how they kind of navigate their journey. So that was something of like, you know, creating that cultural connection and, and something that where we're transferring knowledge in a, in a way that we're keeping the integrity of that knowledge. So an indigenous person filming, an indigenous person talking to the camera, and we're sharing that to indigenous people. So we're keeping that circle, that culture, that connectivity, that integrity of those stories, we're keeping that and we're protecting that. It's not, it's not going out and other people aren't um, viewing that. Um, also innovative solutions. So a lot of indigenous knowledge and, and indigenous knowledge systems those kind of are really what's leading the change, um, not just within in the indigenous entrepreneurship realm, but really in the climate change um, industry, climate justice is uh, indigenous people are really um, spearheading those movements. And so along with the indigenous entrepreneurship realm, we're coming up with um, new innovative solutions, but we're not actually coming up with new ones. We're just looking back, back at our history to look at what's been working for us for since time in memorials for thousands of years, which is trade. Trade is something that indigenous people have been doing a long time since before Columbus came across the ocean there, since before you know the, the creation of the United States and Canada. We've been in Mexico and really a lot of countries, we've been doing this between each other for thousands of years. So entrepreneurship and trade and business and commerce is not something new to indigenous people we've just seemed to have gotten away from that. So we have to get back to that in order to really see their, the prosperity and, 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 and come out of this, um, come out of, I guess not come out of, but re, re-indigenize what, what was once there. Um, also creating value was something that we noticed some of the first cohorts that we created with our program. Um, creating value, being able to create value out of nothing. That's something that indigenous people thrive on. They're able to literally take a pen, a 99 cents pen and, and, and create value around that pen. And what I'm talking about is, you know, to, to the regular person, a 99 cents pen is 99 cents. You know, you use it to, to write and draw on, but to an indigenous person, because we're so good at indigenizing things, we'll take that pen, okay, and we'll put beadwork around that pen and we'll sell it back to somebody and we'll, you know, it's no longer 99 cents. It's actually worth like $30 or $40. That's how good we are at creating value. So like, I'm going to use this as an example for everybody. You can kind of see that it's a, um, a lanyard. And when I bought this lanyard, I bought it for $5. And I took it and I gave it to my friend and I said, hey, can you put beadwork around this, this, this lanyard for my keys? And then he turned around and he sold it back to me for $150. That is what indigenous people are able to do. They can create value looking back at their traditional teachings and, and and putting those two together. That's something that indigenous people thrive on. So it's not foreign. Entrepreneurship is not foreign, but it's also, I feel like Western and colonial style entrepreneurship is very individualistic. Whereas indigenous entrepreneurship, it's very community. It's similar to social, social entrepreneurship, but it's still, we're still defining indigenous entrepreneurship to be a little bit different than social entrepreneurship. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so again, talking about the, the program that we created here at um, St. Paul's University College, um, about a year and a half ago, we, we created this program. We wanted to do it online um, in partnership with uh, the University of Waterloo, but also partnering with uh, Greenhouse, um, the Social Innovation Center. We, we, we started to craft this, 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 this training program where we walk um, students through an eight-step an eight step um, program where basically it's the order of operations of how to start a business. Now it's not exactly, I guess, 
um, how do I say this conventional, it's extremely unconventional. So we took what was there and we indigenized it. And sometimes we had to replace it and throw out so that we can have these indigenous terminologies here and so that it would stick with the indigenous audience. And so we had to create an order of operations that was indigenous through an indigenous lens that had that perspective so that it would resonate with the indigenous audience. Because for such a long time now, especially within business courses and classes, it's very Western, the Western style approach of indigenous um, on an entrepreneurship, sorry, not indigenous entrepreneurs, but on entrepreneurship. So my job was to take that value and decolonize it, restructure it and indigenize it so that it would resonate with our indigenous students a little bit more. And we found that to be a little bit more of a successful route than taking them through this, this approach. This approach seems to work. So it's not recreating the wheel. It's actually just looking back at what's our, what we've been doing for thousands of years and bringing that value back, reintroducing that value and bring it to the forefront on how to, how to share those messages. And so again, online support, this program was offered online. Um, it has a lot to do with reclaiming your power as an indigenous person. You know, it's, it's, it's relighting that fire. It's revisiting and going back to those traditional teachings and bringing them to the forefront of business and how to do business in today's society. Um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we really had to focus on putting everything online. And so when we first, when they were first creating this program, um, we, they had conversations that they didn't know if this could be done online. And that's when I kind of stepped in and I'm like, everything is online these days for indigenous folks. Like you could still be in the Amazon and, and have um, Facebook somehow. You could be in Northern so-called Canada and still catch a, a link to be on Facebook. So we found a way to do it. Um, we had to create um, space for that. And thank goodness for you know, these online support systems, we were able to deliver the program um, all online. And it was in the evening time, um, so far, we've been able to, you know, coach and mentor 42 students. So it's been a year now that we've been doing that. Um, again, creating the program, just re-indigenizing the curriculum at some times, even just throwing the curriculum out and, and redoing it to make it indigenous so that it would resonate with our indigenous students, the young people, so that they can really take some value from, from the program and that we're not just giving them examples that were not applicable or indigenous. We, everything was indigenous, all the way down to the person teaching it, to the, to the knowledge that's being transferred in the way we did that. It wasn't so much a, a PowerPoint or a presentation. We would create experiences, online experiences, where they were indigenous and, and, and they could be, it was indigenous grounded. And so that it's not just a PowerPoint, it's, it's more of an experience now. And so that was kind of a little bit difficult to do, but we were able to accomplish that. We'd have elders come in and say a prayer at the beginning. We would open up with conversations. We would um, facilitate um, the conversation using indigenous um, teachings and experiences. And so that it would resonate a little bit more. Even the program outline, the names were subbed out for indigenous names. So there, it, was a, it was a ton of things that we had to really do to kind of create the program. And of course, outreach, you know, we, we targeted indigenous influencers to share the flyer. And I think we had about 35 people sign up for that first cohort. So it was, it was pretty success, successful. I would say um, it's, been a, it's been one heck of a journey thus far, but it's been a lot of fun. And so again, why indigenous entrepreneurship? Well, our economies matter. The indigenous economy matters. It's important to support that economy. It's important to build that economy up so that it's not always about other things. You know, it's about supporting the community and um, providing careers for people, providing indigenous led solutions for people um, within those spaces. So that's and one of the reasons why indigenous entrepreneurship should be on the top of everybody's mind is how do we, how do we create solutions that are indigenous led, indigenous grounded, and um, indigenous supported. So those were some of the things that we kind of talked about, and and one of the ways to do that is to create an indigenous business so that it's 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 centered, it's indigenous centered and grounded in in indigenous teachings, and it's going to be supported by the community. Um, something that we kind of stumbled upon early on in the program was kinship. 
kinship was something that we talked about is, is developing kinship. That was at the core values of what indigenous entrepreneurship is. You know, it's, it's having that kinship, that care, that, that wanting to support the community. And something that uh, we got from our Southern brothers and sisters from the Navajo Nation is ke. Ke really means kinship. And that means caring for one's relative, caring for one's people, caring for one's community. And we practice kinship through developing businesses that are community led and that solve a problem in community. And so those are some of the things that we kind of found out through teaching the course. And so kinship should be right at the core of any indigenous curriculum. Um, and, and creating value was another thing that we kind of stumbled upon too, is that indigeneity of like being able to create something out of nothing or taking something that exists and putting beadwork around that, making it indigenous. That's something that we're so good at. We have that, that, that intuition that's in our DNA because we've been, we've been trading with people and tribes for thousands of years and leaving a positive impact. That's something that we also talked about is that you know, when you buy from indigenous business owners and arts and crafts or artists, artisans, whatever it may be, you're creating value and in those communities. And indigenous people, usually when we start a, a business, we want to create that positive impact. So we're creating careers for people in, the, in that industry. We're usually trying to give away money, value. We're trying to give away money for a scholarship so somebody can go to school or we want to support other small businesses. That's just what indigenous um, entrepreneurship really is. It's grounded in giving back to community. Um, again, our economies matter. I think it's really important to build up build up the um, indigenous entrepreneurship economy. So I know I have about a minute left, but I really wanted to talk. These numbers are outdated. Um, it's not 19 students from across the country. It's actually 42. Um, we had 19 different business ventures and ideas at, this, at the start of this, but now it's probably up to 30. Um, it's not 12 students anymore. It's more like 22 students. Actually, it's 32 students. Um, it's not six students anymore. It's more like 15 to 17 students and lifelong support system. So like anybody who came through our training program, we really wanted to build that community and we really wanted to focus on, on building out, like it's not just you're going through a program and then you're done. It's more like you can come back to St. Paul's University College. You can email us and we'll write you a reference, reference letter, a letter of support a letter of recommendation saying that you took this program and these are the things that you learned. Um, also, people reach out to me all the time just to ask me business questions and for business advice. And I see it all, all the time on, on social media, like our students support each other. That's something that we always end the, the course of the program with is make sure that you support each other. So those are some of the things that really make Indigenous entrepreneurship stand out and why it matters and the, the and, and these young people, they, they learn how to start businesses at a very young age. I was nine years old selling bubble gum at powwows. That's what I did. That's how I, that's how I, um, what's the word? That's how I afforded to buy my, my PlayStation at the time. That's how I started to buy my games. And so we're just, we just learned that early on how to work and the work ethic of, um, of an entrepreneur is, is really awesome. And, I love doing what I do and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And yeah, I would encourage anybody to start a business um, if that's something that you want to do. So I want to say thank you so much, CS Gus, for letting me present today. And I hope you all have questions to ask me a little bit later. But um, yeah, Nania Sunday for the next 30 minutes. I'll see you later. Thank you so much, Jacob. Interesting presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, so next we're going to, I'm going to introduce Ryan Planch, our next speaker. Ryan Planch is a PhD student in geography at Wilfrid Laurier University. His research in this program focuses on investigating and supporting the creation of alternative indigenous conservation economies. He's currently working with his supervisors on their indigenous environmental stewardship initiative. And this work is being conducted with Indigenous partners in the Northwest Territories and Northern Ontario. 
He most recently completed a Master of Economic Development and Innovation at the University of Waterloo, where he focused his research on understanding how to decolonize and indigenize development work in Canada, specifically focusing on an assessment of conservation-based economies. Before that, Ryan completed the Master of Environmental Studies program at York University. I will now hand it over to you, Ryan, for your presentation. Thanks, Heather. Appreciate it. I'll just share my screen here. Okay. So as long as everyone can see that screen, I'll get started. Uh, so thanks for, for joining in. Um, I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll be a little bit fast to cover a bunch of material, but um, hopefully everything translates. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the work I've been doing uh, around the decolonizing economic production and uh, doing research around grounded and sustainable knowledge economies and larger transitions in uh, the Decho region of the Northwest Territories where I work. Uh, and then we're going to connect that to uh, the efforts of Indigenous youth entrepreneurship and opportunities that come along with that. So in that context, um, I'll do a little introduction of uh, Indigenous grounded economies and what I mean by that, set the context for that development. And we're going to talk about uh, the territorial knowledge economy transition in the Northwest Territories, and then um, connecting to Indigenous youth opportunities for skill development and uh, entrepreneurship and we'll try and connect that to some global significance and applicability for folks watching from around the world. Okay, so a little bit of a self location for, uh, for me, I'm currently in Barrie, Ontario, which is about an hour north of Toronto in Southern Ontario um, in Canada. And I'm calling in from Anishinaabe traditional territory, Odawa, Ojibwe, uh, Potomi Nations, uh, Council of Three Fires and in Treaty 18 territory. So I'm a queer non-Indigenous PhD student working at uh, Wilfrid Laurier. And uh, my kind of role there is to do some constructive criticism of uh, settler economic systems of development. So I'm working with a uh, First Nation called Samba K First Nation in the Decho region, which you can see here, uh, Southern uh, Northwest Territories. And so uh, the work that I'm doing with Samba K First Nation is really about integrating Dene uh, cultural values into their economic development strategy uh, connected to building out uh, their cultural and ecotourism programming. So you can see that the community that I work with um, is in a very complex uh, protected ecosystem network. And um, there are a lot of different inputs and indigenous entrepreneurial activities happening there, right? So indigenous grounded economies, what do I mean by this term? So we're really talking about these diverse knowledge systems, diverse indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems that are contributing to this picture of an economy, which we will um, kind of explore by looking at a slice of this continuation of knowledge systems, right? Um, they're grounded to and interact with reciprocities with lands and waters, non-human participants as well, like animals. Um, and so when we talk about being grounded to land and land-based economies, right? Um, I use a quote here from Glenn Coltard, uh, writing in Re Red Skin, White Masks, um, rejecting the colonial politics of recognition. He says, um, indigenous struggles against capitalist uh, imperialism are best understood as struggles oriented around the questions of land. So struggles not only for land, but also deeply informed by what the land as a mode of reciprocal relationship ought to teach us. The ethical framework provided by these place-based practices and associated forms of knowledge is what I call grounded normativity. So I'm using this sort of form of situated uh, economic activity and placing it in context with indigenous 
grounded economy. So we're looking at this in terms of um, applying a decolonial approach to how we think about economies and economic activity, and also uh, connected to that, how we're thinking about entrepreneurship, right? So these indigenous economies, of course, are not new. Uh, as Jacob also said, they are new to settler ontologies or settler knowledge systems which construct economic activity. Um, but to my indigenous counterparts, of course, they are not new systems. Um, they are related, again, to land-based systems of reciprocity. Um, they include uh, very diverse economic modes of production, right? And they're not monolithic across Canada, across the world. They're all very um, endemic, situated, uh, indigenous knowledge systems contributing to their own economies, right? So how does this connect with value and currency uh, for youth and youth entrepreneurial activities in indigenous communities in the North? Um, for, for myself, I think a big part of this is uh, linking it to the territorial transition to more of a knowledge economy or more traditionally referred to as a service sector-based economy, right? So we have this big transition in Northwest Territories right now to move away from these resource extractive uh, capitalist modes of production and uh, a, a new kind of burgeoning uh, territorial knowledge economy. Uh, coming about. And this is supported by um, a few NGOs of, like Hodi Tsida, uh, Northwest Territories Spore Unit Support, and then also by the um, in, uh, Executive Indigenous Affairs website from the at the territorial level. So they're looking to increase economic diversification, right, by supporting growth in these non-extractive sectors. Um, and so they're going to do that by working with Indigenous and community governments to identify and advance economic op opportunities, right? So we see at the territorial level that they're doing this work to sort of re-stratify what the economy is going to look like. And that is also making room for other worldviews and modes of economic production um, and also for Indigenous youth opportunities, right? So you can see here the green lines are the uh, 10 year change in um, natural resource extraction uh, industries. So this is uh, gross domestic product contribution um, as compared to the blue lines, which are service sector and knowledge based industries, right? So you can see the green lines are quite volatile. And in 2017, there's a steep decline. It will probably um, equalize itself. But I think the point is to move away from these destructive and volatile markets, right? Uh, and this also creates opportunities for youth. In this case, we're looking at um, the amount of research license applications. So if you see here, um, there were 430 research uh, application licenses in the last 30 years, 20, uh, 1986 to 2017. And then only in the last three years, uh, there are 109. So we're already at 25% of a 30 year capacity, right? So you see that reflected in these um, research license applications. This is even just for the Dacho region where I work. Um, and so what are some of the connections to indigenous uh, youth opportunities in these knowledge-based economies, right? So we have these three photos here. Um, I have provided links, I think, that uh, will be shared in the chat, um, and they're all regarding these slides and the, and the next few slides I'll be going over, but the first one is Inspire uh, NWT, so we have Indigenous youth here co-developing curriculum for Indigenous students at the uh, Aurora Polytechnic Institute, so Aurora College is currently in transition to provide uh, degree granting status, and they're doing that in collaboration with Indigenous youth in the territory. Um, the magazine is the, uh, in the middle, is a youth-led culture magazine speaking to Inuvialuit sediment uh, region Indigenous youth issues. It's started by um, two female Indigenous youth um, who have, you know, done this amazing project. The link is also in the chat uh, there. And then we have a, an image from the Deicho Kehaudi Stewardship Program where um, they're creating youth guardians programs uh, with youth input from um, the Deicho First Nations uh, in the region that I work in. Um, and so the, I'm going to highlight two, um, two separate uh, uh, initiatives. So the first one is the uh, Nahedic Research Vessel. So that's part of the Nihani Danger, uh, Dene Rangers program. And so these, uh, this is a research vessel that's about 20 years old. You see it pictured on the left. 
um, and they take uh, Indigenous youth from Lutzel K, First Nation, and they are building skills um, to become stewards or um, environmental, do environmental monitoring or become uh, uh, guardians um, for their traditional territory. Um, and they're doing this with uh, the Indigenous communities on the Great Slave Lake. So this is a program run by an NGO in Canada called Nature United. Um, and so youth coming out of these partnerships and skill development opportunities are able to better integrate and appreciate their own cultural knowledge, right, to form stewardship activities, and they're also learning to create opportunities for themselves and to start and grow sustainable businesses. So this is all part of that larger um, economic uh, and knowledge economy transition. And also we have to remember we're doing this work to decolonize how we imagine economies functioning in different value creations, right? And we're also doing that work to decolonize what we think of and we consider as entrepreneurship. What does entrepreneurship look like in a knowledge-based economy and maybe not a capital or um, private wealth accumulation economy? Um, so this is a Scotty, Re Scotty Creek research station where um, I had the pleasure of going last year as part of my field work. Um, and so what they're doing here is, uh, so it's a privately owned um, research station that's a fly-in um, location and it's owned by Water uh, University of Waterloo and um, faculty at the uh, Wilfrid Laurier, my, my home institution. Um, and they've been running this for about 30 years uh, developing and uh, collecting uh, environmental data on climate change and uh, mostly permafrost monitoring efforts. Um, and so right now what they're doing is they're transitioning the ownership of the research station to uh, um, an indigenous community led model. So they're looking for and integrating um, indigenous youth to do the learning through the research station and partnership with Aurora Polytechnic University up in the north um, and they're developing these skills right so we we have uh, indigenous youth coming into um, Aurora college credits right as part of their research and then they're also um, integrating themselves into stewardship and guardians uh, pro, uh, placements in the sort of bigger conservation economy, right? So they're not only able to um, participate uh, in, an, in the guardian and stewardship programs outside of this, they can also start their own within their community, right? With support from um, some Scotty, Scotty Creek staff. So if we wanna talk about entrepreneurial opportunities for um, indigenous youth that are focused on leadership, um, the two examples I was just talking about um, generate research partnerships, right? So we have this, again, larger transition in the territory from uh, resource extraction based to knowledge based um, and service sector oriented economies. Um, they're able to participate in science and indigenous knowledge system integration, right? So it's no longer this one sided um, equation of Western science is best and better. Um, there are a lot of, um, you know, not without their own problems, but a lot of uh, at least willing participants to do that integrative uh, work. Um, they're also able to do skills development training and um, produce community-based learning outcomes, right? Um, again, that integration with stewardship and guardians programs, as well as to work as independent um, consultants uh, with uh, existing companies or to, to start their own, right? So we have emerging leaders uh, taking this initiative and um, we have a real territorial focus on growing this indigenous youth um, knowledge economy cohort, right? Um, and so what are the sort of some of the global significance or applicability of this? So we have this larger knowledge transition. Um, we also have um, a lot of different trainings that are preparing uh, leaders, right? So the territory is focused on understanding what the benefits are, the social economies, the um, other diverse knowledge systems that come into play when we talk about these larger transitions. Um, and they're also becoming stewards of new entrepreneurial activity. Um, and so part of the research that I'm doing is also investigating um, the Indigenous conservation economy. So I think this integrates well, right? So we have these various inputs coming into new economic models and modes of productivity. So you have, um, you know, 
populations of indigenous communities in various regions in Canada. Um, globally, we're talking about 80% or more uh, of the caretakers uh, for global biodiversity are indigenous communities, right? So I think it's appropriate to talk about the economies uh, and the activities in those economies that are already at play, right? They may be relatively invisible to bigger centralized capitalist modes of economic production, they're no less uh, valuable and active just because they're not visible to those systems. So how do we start to sort of understand what the economic production value is there? So we're going to, again, decolonize our version of what value is and shift it maybe a little from sort of just financial or monetary outputs and consider the greater um, diverse knowledge systems that are adding to these activities, right? So we have knowledge contributions in this case, um, positioning Indigenous youth uh, to be leaders of new economic development opportunities within this Indigenous conservation economy. Um, this idea of the conservation economy isn't new, right? This is something that uh, Mary Simon, who is now the uh, Governor General and also an Indigenous woman here in Canada, um, wrote about in her uh, a new shared arctic leadership model report which i have pictured here um, and so she was writing about uh, she did two years of um, community directed research in nunavut which is our northernmost territory and um, she collected all of these uh, opinions and you know viewpoints from participants and then came up with this idea of how to structure a conservation-based economy so what is the infrastructure what are the values what are the inputs one of the big ones being this sort of stewardship and guardians piece, right? So to close out, I'll just talk about, again, if we want to talk about um, championing global Indigenous youth entrepreneurship, I think we should uh, position youth and uh, leadership in these greener economies by integrating all of our knowledge about um, what the transition is currently that's happening globally to more sort of service sector based or knowledge economies, and then also allowing there to be space for these diverse modes of uh, knowledge systems and modes of economic input to, to take their place right and to to respect and understand that these are there are a lot of different ways of, of thinking about and doing things. Um, and then we're also doing that work to decolonize our thinking around economies in general and entrepreneurship. Um, and that is it. Thanks very much. All right. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation, Ryan. And if anybody has any questions for him, please be sure to put those in the Q&A so we can look at those in a bit. Now I'm going to introduce our, our third and, and final presenter, Dali Nalasco Cruz. Dali is a Nahua indigenous woman from Puebla, Mexico. She is a coordinator of the Terra Madre Indigenous Network of Slow Food International for Latin America and the Caribbean. Dali has over 10 years of experience in the design and implementation of training, capacity building and productive projects with a gender and intercultural perspective. Her work supports biodiversity and food production from indigenous communities and farmers that follow the slow food principles, good, clean, and fair food. She is the co-founder and sales director of the indigenous women-led company, Mopampa. I'll hand it over to you, Dolly. Hola, muchísimas gracias. Hello, thank you very much. I, uh, it is a, a great pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to be talking about the experience of Mopampa, which is a company of uh, Nahua indigenous uh, women. I want to share with you first a video. I'm going to share screen. We are a community that produces Chile Serrano. We are a company of women. We are indigenous women. We are poor. My name is Dalí Nolasco Cruz. I was born in Tlaola, Puebla. I am 20, 28, 28 years old. 
My name is Carolina Lorenzo Cruz. I'm 23 years old. I'm a young indigenous Nahuatl woman. My grandmother's name is Maria Lucia Cruz de la Rosa. I am from Tlaola, Puebla in Mexico. And welcome. This is my business, a social business that is called Mopampa. And right now we are looking to the red chiles that they are red in order to make the salsas. It gives us an identity because this salsa for us is ancestral for our grandmothers, great grandmothers, and it has a very special flavor. And we're very excited because this is part of our history. And there are many traditional foods that are being lost. This salsa we have eaten for many, many years when our grandparents would teach us. And my grandmother taught me how to uh, cultivate it, to dry it, and that's what it reminds me. Did you make it with love? Yes, of course, with love, because uh, this is uh, love, that enthusiasm, and you know in your mind that it is very, very good. You are burning the chile, and then you imagine how good it is. They are delicious. They are the most delicious in all the country of Mexico. To get organized first in order to obtain a credit to harvest the chile. And we noticed that the chile, when it's red, nobody buys it. So it takes a long time and work. So we, the women, buy the red chile and also uh, the one that we uh, harvest and we transform it into salsas. We are learning to do something different, something that was prohibited to women because culturally it's always the men who initiate new businesses. And when it's a business of women and the ones that are leaders and making their own decisions, these are women. And yes, it's something that a cultural level is very impacting. We always work with the topic of um, changing sayings. And it, they say women together, not even dead. And we say women um, together create great things. It is empowered to empower us uh, financially. Women feel important, owners important, and they feel that they have something of their own and they no longer um, allow to be abused and they can uh, progress by themselves. And the truth is that since we started working with slow food, people has turned and looked at us. It's like visualizing the work that we do and there is the possibility. There are things that we can do here and they have a great potential. And especially that the people who are not here, who are outside, give value and admire and they like. And this is something that gives us great happiness. And it has given me many opportunities that I never imagined I would have to start maybe uh, no, go to another country or maybe uh, for a people like me, it looks like impossible. And that has allowed me to meet more people, especially to visualize uh, some salsas that they are eating in uh, Italy or in Denver or that pe foreigners can taste it or people come to Tlaola. This is something beautiful. And also for my coworkers, it is like, um, it's like uh, somebody recognizing my work and it was worthwhile, especially for those of us who started this, especially my mother, it was worthwhile of uh, not being home and to be judged and to be singled out and abused. The uh, acknowledgement that is given to Mopampa and that they give to their work and the salsas, it's worthwhile what we're doing. I think that what we're doing is like uh, start opening the path so that those behind us would be easier to uh, transit this uh, path. So this is our purpose to facilitate the life of other women because I don't want I don't want other women to live the same violence that I experienced. So if I can do that so that that doesn't happen, I will do it more than happy. The dream is that we can live uh, from that work to sell a lot 
and that we can have profits and also that our grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews can continue with this project and they, they continue. And this is a first uh, step to make this uh, company uh, sustainable. And this is what uh, excites me. And also the, uh, also to see my brother and that I'm going to be over there on my birthday and I'm going to see him and hug him. This is something very powerful. I never thought I was going to have a visa and it wasn't, it was something that I wasn't excited, but when they told me that I was going to get a visa, I thought I'm going to see my brother and that's very emotional. We are a community of uh, producers of Chile Serrano. We are a women business owned. We are indigenous and we are Mopampa. Bueno, quería compartirles este... I wanted to I wanted to share with you this video because I'm going to be talking and I wanted you to know the women. I always, uh, when I talk about Mopapa, I always get very excited because this is a company, this is a project that has a connection at a personal level, which is very strong. And before I start, I wanted to tell you and I wanted to, you to meet these women because in the end, this uh, business owned by women, indigenous women, have a human uh, strength which is very impressive. So I uh, start to tell you who we are. We are Nopampa. This is a company of indigenous women who was, which was born in 1992. We started community work. My mother, Lucia, started this business. She started with this, con with this concerns from the community. She called other women to get organized. In Tlaola, we uh, produce Chile Serrano or Serrano Chile. And we saw this traditional um, production as an alternative so that we as women could start making incidents in other spaces. How this, did this uh, dream begin? In 2007, we had a competition of traditional um, dry salsas with uh, with students from a technological school, which are very close to our community. And we produced as dry salsas from Chile Serrano, going back. We are producers of Chile Serrano. The Chile Serrano is sold in a traditional manner in green for the very big markets. But for the community, the red chiles uh, stay with us and those are saved for the seeds for the next production. And also that, so that we, the families can have chile for the rest of the year, because we all, we only produce salsas. We only produce chile. The chile is produced or harvested once a year. So these dry salsas are, it's a traditional recipe from our grandmothers, great grandmothers, to make sure that we have a picante or, or um, spicy food, the whole year, the Mexican sea, very spicy food. Since 2008, because of a economic crisis, we started selling this um, salsas in Puebla with some friends, with some acquaintances. And this is how this idea started. In 2010, we, took, we made the decision of promoting this salsa uh, and to go from the home production to a larger scale. In 2011, this is our company. In 2011, I'm sorry, 2012, we had our manufacturing plan and we uh, opened it in 2013 formally. And this dream, this construction has been thanks to the work and the collaboration of other organizations. 
civil organizations and government institutions and obviously of our work. We are in the northern sierras of the state of Puebla. It's an indigenous community. It's very small. This is a satellite view of our community. So you can see, and all of us are Chile Serrano producers. So I wanted to share a little bit about our dream. First, because the indigenous communities and the communities of the rural areas, which are the ones that produce these uh, foods, we are the ones that have a unjust price for our productions. In Mexico and many other parts of the world, there's a whole system of coyotaje or where the buyers go to the communities to buy the products and they pay it at a very low price. So this is one of the reasons. Another reason was that uh, women are invisible in the production processes and also in the marketing of a very important product in our community, like the Serrano Chile. We are the ones that protect the seeds. We are also the ones that plant, harvest, contribute. And at the end, uh, when we reach the point of negotiations, when we have to sell the production, the ones that do this are men. So this was also one of the reasons why in Mopampa, was born in order to go into these spaces where we women are completely invisible. And also we acknowledge that women, indigenous women and non-indigenous also are the ones that protect a very impressive heritage, which is not valued because of our conditions of gender, because we are women. And some of these, like all these traditional recipes, and since uh, we are, or our work is completely invisible, then we wanted to create this uh, possibility of a generation of self-employment and also of a generation of uh, a patrimony, especially recognizing that women, uh, women are not the owners of the earth. I said this in the video, women, because of uh, the fact that we are women, we suffered discrimination. And then we women and the indigenous women, because we are women and then for being indigenous, we have double discrimination. And then we say that women are poor. Why, why are we poor? Because we are not the owners of the land. Uh, I would like to ask this question, and if you want to raise your your hand, please share with me. The women who are present in this forum, how many of you are owners of the land? This means that you have a legal document that says that where you are living right now, that land is yours. I'm sure that we will see just a few women who really do own the land. And the ones that own the land are women who are very, very fortunate because I always give this example and I hope that I'm not wrong in my data. 1% of the land of the property in the world belong to women. And I always give this example. Just imagine the big, big cake of the land. This is a very big cake and only 1% of this uh, land belongs to all the women who live in this planet. So this uh, company is born also to visualize this great problem and also so that women can have access through a company so they can have um, a right to the land which has been denied for years. So this is like a little bit about the reason why Mopampa was born. And there are many axles that are, go through this uh, dream that we have. Another one is that we also see the severe situation in which we are losing the 
biodiversity of our territory. We are seeing at least the native um, seeds of the indigenous uh, food chain. So we created Mopampa in order to defend our seed, a criolla seed that gives us a lot of identity and through the traditional production preserves biodiversity. So this company is not only to generate money. So through our existence as through an indigenous our community. indigenous roots, we want to protect the whole system. Biodiversity, protect women, defend women's rights, uh, generate uh, local economies. So this is the, why we created Mopampa. These are some pictures of the founders of Mopampa. I'm very, very proud of saying that we are a company that was able to uh, tr make the transition from a dream, from a collective dr a dream to a reality. This project was uh, started by Lucia. This is my mother and with all, all, all these women. And now I am the second generation of these women that decided to start their own dream. We are now in the third generation, the grandchildren, the granddaughters, uh, and the mothers, the daughters, the granddaughters that are uh, uh, with the, that continue with this dream. So we are very, very proud of that. This is what I was saying. It is very important for us to start uh, having all these generations to get involved because uh, this project should not stop with the second generation. Our mother started this project and when they die, Mopampa should continue being a reality. They don't want to see the company die when they all die. This is a collective dream, and we they want we want uh, this dream to continue. So we need to uh, educate the human capital to train the, the human capital. We believe that we need to uh, continue training uh, women in a comprehensive manner to continue empowering women and to continue owning the project. These are some of the topics we work with. And here I would like to share something very important with you. When we talk about uh, indigenous entrepreneurs and especially of women, indigenous women, where there is a huge stigma because of the conditions I mentioned before, because they are women, they are, do not own their uh, land. And it is very difficult to see our, ourselves as entrepreneurs. So all these training courses, all these uh, education programs are for women to uh, believe in themselves. And now there are women that stand up and say, I am an entrepreneur. I am the creator of a company. So it is very important to accompany these women in their in, in, in enterprises. There is a, 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 belief, a system of beliefs that ha have to be eliminated. So I don't know if I have enough time, but I'm going to continue right now saying that Mopam, Mopampa is an indigenous, is part of an indigenous community, and we have a great connection with our Mother Earth. So we always protect the environment, we collect the rainfall, we are responsible for our own waste, we have a, a, a treatment, a water treatment plant, uh, we uh, provide this uh, area for others. We are working hard to uh, create a center where we can talk about agro uh, ecological production where Creole seeds are protected and share our knowledge. And I would also like to share that as a, an, an enterprise, we are very much committed with the food and uh, food right we are part of the slow food uh, movement international movement we are the uh, uh, bastion number 500 of this uh, uh, movement baluarte slow food 
and all human beings in this planet must have access to good, clean and fair food. Before I move to the other slide, I would like to share that at a personal level, I am member of the Indigenous Network of Slow Food International, and we are working with indigenous communities and young uh, uh, and indigenous and with indigenous youth, as all the presenters mentioned, it is very important to uh, create or to share this knowledge among indigenous communities. The indigenous people have uh, denied spaces where we can share this information. So sharing all this knowledge is extremely important for all of us. And I would like to share with all of you some pictures of our company. We have been able to achieve many things as women, as indigenous, as, indigenous, as a part of an indigenous group with never thought that we were going to be able to have our own enterprise, but this is the result of a lot of efforts. We have many challenges we face and uh, that we want to overcome. The pandemic uh, also had a negative impact on us. We had to stop the production in our company for safety reasons, so we had to close our company and we had to stop selling. But now that the pandemic in Mexico is, uh, is not over, but it were with a, a green light, and we are starting to uh, continue with our activities because we want to continue, we want to achieve our goals, we want to place our products in a wider uh, market, uh, and uh, we are going to we want to sell our, uh, the, our product ab abroad. We're working very hard to have a very clear and transparent management. We have uh, professionalized our, our skills, our uh, everything related to taxes. Once you are an entrepreneur, you start learning about tax related issues and other areas. Uh, we are developing all our skills and capacities. We are working hard from a women perspective. This is something we have to take into consideration that the organization has to continue being strong. Women should feel empowered, should feel that they are accompanied and we have to support each other so we can uh, empower uh, women in economic uh, aspects, but this empowerment should be done through access to all women rights. We know, and uh, certainly you know, that Mexico is a country where uh, gender-based uh, violence is, second, is a, a major issue. There are very, uh, high in numbers of violence against women. And we as indigenous women and as women entrepreneurs have also faced uh, this violence in, the, in our communities as we shared in the video. What we are doing in our communities is uh, really uh, breaking all these beliefs and uh, we have been po being pointed at, we have been uh, received uh, these, uh, these ideas of that we, you are crazy, why are you working on that? But when women, other women see this company, when they see us buying our, selling our salsas and women start believing in our company and the people in our community start supporting us as well. Something important as a company or as an enterprise, we can be an economic option for producers. 
we they have to see us as a women entrepreneurs the that can buy the Serrano Chile at a fair price. And we our we want our salsa to be seen all over the world. It is a, like a chain. We don't want to become rich, but we want the uh, Laola uh, Creole Serrano Chile to preserve that women can have access to other spaces. We want women to have a be better in a better income that uh, women can protect our uh, biodiversity and we can continue uh, breaking this uh, system of beliefs. We, we as women, as indigenous women say, we can do it and we can set an example for the young the women Grandes posibilidades. With, and they Así can see que, that they have a future that can have lots of possibilities. There are many other things that I could tell about this project, but I don't know, have enough time, but thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Ali, thank you so much for your presentation. And it was very inspiring and beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, if anybody has has any additional questions for Dolly or any of the other presenters, you can please put those in the Q and A. And um, yeah, that wraps up the the panel presentation. So we're going to to move on to the question and answer session. So if the three presenters could join us again. Um, so we've yeah we've had a couple questions from from the audience and I'll start with one um, from Sharifa, which is to Jacob. So we could start with Jacob and then if others um, might have ideas to add in as well. So um, Sharifa said you mentioned indigenous innovative solutions and knowledge with regards to climate change and climate justice. And could you please give some concrete examples about that? Concrete examples are um, uh, the Anishinaabe, um, Isaac Murdoch he talked about, um, he's an indigenous knowledge holder and keeper um, in Northern so-called Ontario. They used to live without trash. And so I think one of the things that we need to talk about is just that was their way of fighting climate change back then because we nowadays we have like our house, we have like a thousand things in it, right? So I think it's it's shifting the mind of what an indigenous dream is and you know what our, our dreams are today and making sure that uh, although we have to find that balance that we're not falling too much into consumerism, which leads to capitalism. And I know once I say that everybody like shuts off because it's such against the way of life that we live in today. And so um, that's one example um, on how they used to check climate change, how indigenous people used to collect, check climate change back in the day, but because of the way we live in today, because of colonization and all that fun stuff, we've kind of slipped into this other way of being, which leads into consumerism and the overuse of things. So yeah, that's one example. I know that's not written down in some kind of fancy smancy uh, book because of, um, you know, that's another thing too is, indigenous knowledge and Western society clash. And unfortunately we live in this world that doesn't really value indigenous knowledge um, or what they're trying to now, which is great, but it's still, it's always gonna clash because a lot of our history is oral and it's not exactly written down in fancy books and stuff like that. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, there's actually, there's um, another question um, from Trefa, and she was, uh, this is for Ryan. Um, so this is regarding the global ap applicability of indigenous leadership, consultancy and conservation work that you were discussing. Um, are, are the indigenous youth also trained um, and or involved in the youth work in the current convention on biological diversity negotiations? proposed 2020 global biodiversity framework and in promoting traditional knowledge in the access and benefit sharing space. 
Thanks, um, Heather, and thanks, Ruth. For, that's a great question. Um, a short presentation. You don't always have the space to cover everything you would like, but um, yeah, so the student curriculum in their host institutions in Aurora College or in high school, uh, I'm not sure if they cover the breadth of the CBD, the Convention on um, Biological Di Diversity. Um, and I don't know exactly about how they would treat um, the kind of proprietary nature of um, traditional knowledges and all their diversity in the territory. But I know um, through the two examples that I shared, um, the youth are involved in uh, an educational component, which uh, does go over the, the CBD and the national targets here in Canada, right? So we have uh, 20, uh, 20 by 20, uh, sorry, 25% uh, biological or um, uh, biodiversity protection by 2025, and we have a goal of 30% by um, 2030. Uh, so they cover the basics of those things. And then in regards to um, traditional knowledge, so I think what you're talking about is the Article 8 um, in this CBD. So we're talking about traditional knowledge, innovations, and practices. And so those are kept um, those are kept under knowledge sharing and research agreements that are individual to the in universities and the institutions that are working with um, Indigenous youth. So they're encouraged to have that conversation um, about how they would like their traditional knowledge shared and what information they would also um, wish to in in exclude from any publication or, um, you know, they're very specific agreements that um, these organizations will have with the youth and the host nations um, that the youth are living in. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, all right, we have one more question. I think we have time for one more question. Um, again, from Sharifa. So thank you, Sharifa, for your questions. Um, yeah, this the last one is for Dolly. Um, so, yeah, she was saying that the, the increase in visibility, skills, and status of gender equity via environmental friendly agroecology is very inspiring. Um, and the question is, would there be diversified production to other products uh, since biodiversity is also important in ecological agriculture? Sí, okay. Espero responder correctamente. I hope I can answer correctly, but there is a diversified production in in terms of the Serrano Chile. In, you probably know how the maize production works. If there is such a, an environment around it. The same thing happens with the Serrano Chile. Where we cultivate uh, Serrano Chile, we can uh, find uh, quelites, which is also a product from uh, the indigenous community. Sometimes we can find squash, or we can also uh, find uh, corn or maize, and they also grow other species, such as uh, papalo or uh, coriander or, or uh, squash so that when the Serrano Chile production is over, then they can continue with the squash. So they combine the production. So for us, it is extremely important to have this uh, biodiversity. That's why uh, Mopampa wants to continue uh, protecting the Serrano Chile production uh, or harvesting process because in the territory, and this is a worldwide a problem, that uh, that transgenic uh, transgender seeds uh, are a threat. The pesticides put uh, our our biodiversity at risk. We have been losing many kelite uh, uh, species, which are very important for us. And here we can see how. Uh, severe this problem is. So Mopampa as a company or as an enterprise not only focuses on uh, producing salsa or being uh, become rich, right? But through this salsa, we can uh, protect all these uh, food if, that come from the indig indigenous communities. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much, Dolly. Um, so I had a, we had a question um, from the group about um, sharing emails. So I just wanted to to double check if you all are okay for us to share emails with with the attendees so that they can follow up if they have any additional questions. Okay, great. So we can we can do that after after the event. And I think that um, yeah we. Maybe can end with one um, one additional question. We have a little bit of time left. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, I was going to ask um, how how can people coming from settler or newcomer communities better support indigenous entrepreneurs? So, if anyone has a, a thought on that to end with, that would be great. Go ahead, Jacob. I think just buying locally from the indigenous person, I think that would probably be the best way to do it. Um, just because, you know, a lot of things are outsourced overseas and sometimes can be fake, especially when it comes to turquoise. Um, you know, the Navajo Nation, the Zunis, the Pueblos down there, they, they make beautiful work. And, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Navajo Nation, but there's poverty down there. And so one way to end poverty within indigenous, you know, communities and nations is to purchase goods and services from them. Um, and, and they'll probably tell you the story with the gift as well. And so as long as you're able to, you know, I bought this from, you know, this lanyard from Jacob, and this is a traditional Satana design, and it's it's for protection you're keeping the integrity of the story with that gift. And so it's not exactly, um, I think a lot of people get a little bit worried about like cultural appropriation, stuff like that. I think as long as you're protecting the, the integrity and that you're, you're wearing it in, in the appropriate um, time and place, I think it should be fine. Um, where things kind of start to get out of hand is when they get taken out of that context. And then, you know, people start wearing, you know, feather hats or whatever during sporting events, and it starts to get a little bit out of hand there. But I think as long as you're sourcing it from lo the local Indigenous community, you should be fine. Oh, also support Indigenous-led nonprofits. That's another way to do it, because those are still businesses. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Ryan, did you want to add to that? And then, um, yeah, Dolly could could add to that after him. I'll just repeat the question um, for for um, everybody. Um, so I was just asking, how can people coming from settler or newcomer communities better support indigenous entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think Jacob had. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dolly, if you like. Okay. Muchas gracias. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm going to speak in general. I believe that each one of us had, uh, had to learn. We had to learn to question what we uh, consume because um, this is very important because when we decide what uh, we are going to consume, we are making political decisions. Uh, Jacob already mentioned this, not only consume products from indigenous uh, interpreters, 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 but organizations that are doing extraordinary work. Um, I think that creating an awareness, when you go to the supermarket to question, who are you buying from? Where are you taking that money? Who is um, receiving a benefit or a profit when you consume? At the end of my presentation, I had put it and I didn't have time to present it, but the invitation is question ourselves, what do we consume? And also the invitation is to make an aware consuming, solidarity consume, and to be very clear when we go and buy something from there, we are doing a political act. And this is where we start changing this reality. Thank you so much, Dolly. And Ryan, did you want to add anything to that? Sure, I think uh, just to kind of build off of what both Jacob and Dolly had, 
had said about questioning and um, kind of understanding. So I think, you know, don't be afraid to reach out uh, in your local communities to see what Indigenous entrepreneurial efforts are, are happening. You know, I'm sure folks would be more than happy to, to talk to you about what resources are available. Um, and I think also just to do that work to decolonize some of your thinking and understanding about how uh, diverse economic um, practices function and, and how best to support them. Great. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you again. I, that's, that concludes our Q&A session. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the presenters for joining us today and, and sharing your wisdom and insights. And thank you to all the participants and everyone who joined us in the audience for listening and offering some questions. And I hope, I hope you learned some, some new things today and continue to explore this area. Um, I have one final introduction um, for, for the session and that is for Bon Gatkuth. Uh, bon is the coordinator of diverse and inclusive outreach and engagement at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And she's here today to tell us about the CEC's Youth Innovation Challenge. So thank you so much, everybody. And I'll hand it over to Bon. Thank you, Heather. And thanks again to our presenters today for some really interesting discussion. I think all of us on the call today are really eager to follow up and, and learn more about some of the work that you've been referencing. Um, I simply wanted to take a couple of minutes at the end of this session just to talk about the CEC's Youth Innovation Challenge. We have uh, been uh, um, holding this challenge since 2017, and we've met young entrepreneurs from across North America who are building solutions for environmental challenges in their communities. And uh, we're running the uh, sixth edition of the challenge this year. And the challenge is actually open right now. If you visit cec.submittable.com, you can submit your solutions to the challenge and compete for $15,000 Canadian, as well as an opportunity to present your solutions to the top environment ministers of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. You'll also have opportunities for uh, mentorship and networking if you apply to the challenge. And so we really encourage you to either share this opportunity um, with those in your network. I have a colleague who just shared information in the chat box or simply reach out to myself or one of my colleagues at cec.org. Uh, if, if you have any questions. And with that, I will leave it to Brock uh, to, or, or Heather to finish uh, the rest of this uh, conversation. And um, we're looking forward to the next uh, session next week. Thanks, Ben. I really appreciate that. The Youth Innovation Challenge is, is such a great competition. So I would really encourage those of you who are taking part today to, to, to reach out and take part. It opens really interesting doors for the youth and students who, who choose to get involved in this. I want to say thank you again to our, our three presenters, to, to Dolly, to, to Ryan, to, to Jacob. We really appreciate the time and the energy and the effort, but also the insight and the wisdom that you've shared with us today. Uh, this is how we make the important changes that you all talked about. So thank you for taking the time to, to share this with us. Thank you to Heather as well. You did a great job as our facilitator. We appreciate the fact that you were wading through those questions and keeping us all on track. Thank you to the folks at Waterloo and at the CEC who've been working behind the scenes to bring this session together. Uh, and finally, thank you to, to Lillian and the technical team and to all of the interpreters who've uh, made this content available to, to so many of us in so many languages in so many places around the world. Next week is our final session for this round of Green Entrepreneurship Workshops. We'll be looking at how to succeed as a student with a startup uh, in the green entrepreneurship space. We hope we see you there. Uh, until then, stay safe. Um, keep, uh, keep spreading the word about these events uh, and take the time to reflect on, on those Indigenous entrepreneurs who may be looking for your support in the community that you live in. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week.